In 2010, I joined a horrified world when a 12,000 pound, 22 foot long male orca named Tillicum killed his trainer, Don Branchow, at SeaWorld Orlando. We were all beyond sad. But those of us who knew what orcas experience in concrete tanks were not surprised. In fact, Tillicum, who you see here, had killed two times before. I've been studying dolphin and whale brains from individual whales who stranded up on the beach for many years. And I also worked with captive dolphins in marine parks. I was interested in their intelligence, their brain capacity, their cognition, their self-awareness. This is me holding a bottlenose dolphin brain. And as you can see, the brain is much larger than ours, but what's interesting is that it's also more convoluted or wrinkly on the surface. That means they've packed a lot of brain tissue into their skull in the 55 million years that they've been adapting to an aquatic environment. That also means that there are parts of their brain that are especially well developed, not just in the acoustic realm that we hear about, but also in processing who they are and who others are. And it turns out that the orca brain is the most convoluted brain on Earth. My 25 years of studying dolphins and whales has taught me that these aquatic mammals are highly intelligent, have large, complex brains that are actually organized differently than ours. And they are so socially sophisticated that they actually have cultural traditions. And there was not a single case of an orca harming a human being in their natural environment. So this told me that there is something wrong with captivity. And I knew well before that incident in 2010. So I want to tell you my story. In 2001, I was a faculty member at Emory University in Atlanta. And my colleague Diana Reese and I published a groundbreaking study. We showed that dolphins can recognize themselves in mirrors. And we did the study with two captive dolphins at the New York Aquarium. We marked them on different parts of their body and they used the mirror to investigate the marks. This was important because it showed that they had a self-awareness, a sense of self similar to our own. <laughs> Everything was going great. We got a lot of notoriety internationally, and cartoons about the study were everywhere. And even Jay Leno mentioned our findings on The Tonight Show. I prepared to go on to study self-awareness in orcas, beluga whales, and other cetaceans, dolphins and whales, in captivity. But little did I know that this study was to change my life forever. You see, I was taught as a scientist 
I am not supposed to take an advocacy position of any kind. That animal advocacy, in particular, was fringy and weird. And that I had to choose between science on the one hand and advocacy on the other, but I couldn't do both. And my students at Emory were being told exactly the same thing. But I began to think about what it would be like to be a highly intelligent, highly social, self-aware being living in a concrete tank, swimming around and around and around in circles for the rest of my life. And I also did research on the welfare of these animals in marine parks. And I found that their lives are short and stressful, and that they are deprived of everything that makes life worth living for them. And the two dolphins I worked with on the celebrated mirror study, Tab and Presley, both died at a very early age, in their early 20s. And that is when I realized I could not ignore what I had learned that these are self-aware beings, and I decided against working with captive animals. I also knew I had to give something back to those animals who I enjoyed studying for so long. I became a scientist advocate for dolphins and whales, and began to realize that being a scientist or a scholar in any field is not in conflict with being an advocate. In fact, it is our responsibility. Now today, public opinion has shifted away from keeping orcas and other whales in concrete tanks for entertainment thanks to the documentary Blackfish. And in 2011, when I was asked to participate in the film, I jumped at the chance to talk about the big brains and the intelligence and social structure of orcas to help people to understand how something like what happened in 2010 with the trainer could happen and why these animals belong in the ocean. I knew the answer was sanctuary. The answer to ending the use of these animals in the entertainment park is sanctuary. The difference between a real sanctuary for animals and a zoo or a marine park is that in a real sanctuary, the animals come first. Why sanctuary and not release? Well, in most wild animals who have lived in captivity for a very long time just don't know how to survive on their own. So you need to take, take care of them. Now, there are sanctuaries for all kinds of wild animals. Big cats, great apes, bears, elephants, you name it. But there are none for dolphins and whales. And that was a part of the future that had to change. So, in 2016, I brought together a group of marine mammal scientists and veterinarians and engineers and experts in other fields to create a new future for dolphins and whales. We started the Whale Sanctuary Project. Our mission is to create a model seaside sanctuary where 
captive orcas and beluga whales can live in a natural environment while still being cared for. And this is what the future for captive dolphins and whales looks like. Not the small, barren, concrete tanks where every part of their life is dictated to them, but a chance to spend their days exploring a natural environment and doing whatever they wish. We're looking for a netted bay, at least 70 acres, enough depth so that they can dive, and there will be a veterinary facility and even uh, an area where people can view the whales from a distance, not intrusively. And we were going, we're going to have educational programs that will help people understand why these animals should be respected and why the ocean they live in needs to be conserved. We are investigating sites in Washington State, British Columbia, and Nova Scotia, and we are down to two priority sites that we are really working on. And By the summer of this year, we should be able to announce where the first site will be. But we will plan to be open and have our first residence by 2020. So I'm here to tell you that no matter what you are studying or what you're good at, or what aspect of the world you want to change, you can apply your own talents and education to create the world you want to live in. And don't take no for an answer. Abraham Lincoln said that the best way to predict the future is to create it. So thank you all for being here. I welcome meeting you and taking questions right after this event. Thank you.